you very much. It's going to be hard to top that uh, <laughs> tour of the B-17 there. That's just fantastic. Uh, I'm glad to be here tonight. Thanks for coming out. I'm glad uh, the weather's cooperating and the rains hold off and, and to, until uh, later tonight. Uh, growing up, I knew the basics of my dad's World War II history. Uh, I knew as a B-17 pilot, he was stationed in England with the 8th Air Force. His plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. Uh, he flew uh, bombing missions over occupied Europe and uh, Germany. And in February of 1944, his plane was shot down. And after he bailed out, he was missing in action for seven months, but he evaded capture and ev uh, eventually made it back to England. But it wasn't until I retired until 2000, 2009 that I actually had the time to really delve into my dad's war history in more detail. At that time, I had no intention of writing a book whatsoever. I just wanted to go through all the material that my parents had kept uh, from the war years. They had kept quite a few things. <laughs> there are two items that were most significant, and the first was uh, my dad's diary. And as I mentioned, it was absolutely ri ri uh, riveting. And, so much so that it was included in two books that were written. On the left, uh, the book is The Mighty Eight by Gerald Astor, which is about the Eighth Air Force that was stationed in England during the war and flew high altitude daylight precision bombing missions. And the goal of the Eighth Air Force was to hit industrial and military targets to cripple Germany's ability to make war. Uh, the term Mighty Eight was coined by the noted historian Roger Freeman because of the number of planes that the Eighth Air Force could put up on their missions, which numbered into the hundreds. And on December 24th of 1944, they had 2,000 bombers that bombed hit Berlin. And I get excited when I see one B-17. I can't even imagine what it must have looked like to see 2,000 uh, in the sky. Uh, the other book was First Over Germany, written by Russell Strong. It was about the 306 bomb group that my dad was in. Uh, Russell Strong was a navigator in the 306 bomb group, and after the war became its uh, historian and uh, formed the 306 Historical uh, Association, of which I'm a member of the board of directors. I, actually, I'm immediate past president of the 306 uh, Bomb Group Historical Association. Uh, the 306 motto was first over Germany because they were the first bomb group to bomb a target in Germany on January 27th of 1943. They were also the oldest serving bomb group in the 8th Air Force. Uh, they arrived in England in September of 1942, and they didn't go back home until December of 1946. Uh, after the war, they stayed over. They were involved in the uh, Casey Jones Project, which was the aerial photo mapping of Western Europe and uh, Northern Africa. Uh, the other item that was really significant were all the letters that my dad had written to my mother while he was stationed in England that she kept. And reading those letters were absolutely fascinating. Uh, my dad was very candid in what he wrote. Uh, he wrote about bombing missions, what life was like in England and London at the time, uh, escapades of his, uh, his crew members' life uh, on, on the base. And uh, after reading those letters, I became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. And I started reading book and book uh, about the air war over Europe. I went on the internet and spent countless hours doing research, downloading declassified military documents. I joined a number of World War II uh, associations and started going to their reunions, listening to veterans tell their stories. And then finally in 2012, I came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it needed to be heard and told and people needed to read about it, so I decided to write a book. From the time I started my research to the time the book was published was four and a half years. I actually started my own publishing company, Seabreeze Publishing, a one-person limited liability company named after the street I live on in Seal Beach. And then I contracted with independent professionals for all the associated services, such as editing, cover design, interior layout, printing the book, fulfillment, and so forth. And the book was released in August of 2014. It's won 25 national book awards in that time. Uh, it kind of, the first half of the book builds up to the day that the plane was shot down, and then the second half of the book is all about what happened to each member of the crew. It's just not about my dad, but about what happened to each member of the crew, and about all the Belgian people that risked their lives to help them. But I probably wouldn't have written the book if it hadn't been for two Belgian gentlemen 
up in the upper left corner, you see my dad on the left, and next to him is Dr. Paul Delahaye. Uh, that picture was taken in 1994, at the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium, and my dad's plane getting shot down. And in the lower right uh, corner, you have uh, me and Jacques Lallot. Uh, Jacques and Paul were young boys during the war, and they were greatly affected by it. They saw firsthand the atrocities that the Nazis committed against their family and friends. And later on in life, they became local historians, and they interviewed uh, Belgium citizens and members of the underground about events that took place involving my dad and his crew. And they documented their testimony, and they gave me unbelievably detailed information that's in the book about events that would have been lost forever without their dedicated research. So I owe them a, a great deal. Initially, my dad didn't go into the Air Force. As a result of the first peace, peacetime draft, and U.S. history implemented by President Franklin uh, Roosevelt in the fall of 1940. My dad went into the Army. Uh, he enlisted in uh, Los Angeles in uh, April of 1941, and he was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. And at the time, the U.S. military was woefully weak. They ranked 18th in the world behind Romania in military strength. And as you can tell by that World War I vintage uniform that he's wearing here, they were also very ill-equipped. Uh, three months later, he married Ruth Hempel. Uh, this is their wedding picture at First Lutheran Church in Pasadena. My mom was born and raised in Pasadena. And my dad was born in Norfolk, Nebraska, but he moved out to Southern California with his family when he was 13. A few months later, on December 7th of 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. And the United States was at war. Well, my mom was really concerned about the future. Things were very uncertain at that time. So uh, over Christmas, she went up to visit my dad in Washington. And nine months later, Susan Ruth was born. <laughs> well, my dad at the time was a little concerned how he was going to support his new family. as a new bride, a baby on the way, and he didn't think he could support him very well in the privates paying the army. So he decided to volunteer for the Air Force. So in June of 1942, he went through pre-flight training at uh, Santa Ana, California, and then went through the various phases of pilot training. This slide's a little uh, difficult to see, but it shows the uh, various stages. There's three basic straight, uh, stages to become a pilot. Uh, the first was uh, primary training, and it's very tough to get through pilot school. 40% of the guys that started didn't, uh, were washed out and didn't finish. Uh, they typically became bombardiers and navigators. Uh, after primary training, they went into basic training. And from basic training, they separated the pilots out. They either went into uh, single-engine planes or fighters, or they went into uh, twin-engine planes, which are uh, bombers or uh, transport planes. My dad was uh, six foot three. He went into bombers. Typically, the smaller pilots went into fighters because of the cramped conditions of the cockpit. But I personally feel it also de uh, depended on pers their personality seems to me uh, fighter pilots tended to be somewhat cocky, independent, risk takers, be more individualistic, where the bomber pilots tended to be more level-headed and more team players. Here you see my dad right after he soloed in primary training. Uh, you couldn't wear your goggles on the top of your helmet, the helmet until you soloed. So he was, this is a proud moment for my dad where uh, he soloed and came down wear his uh, goggles on top of his helmet. Back then, I think everyone uh, uh, smoked. Uh, these are the three planes that he flew during pilot training. Up on top, in primary training, he threw, uh, flew a Stearman uh, biplane, and then the middle plane is a multi-valiant that he flew in basic training. And then in advanced pilot training, he flew uh, a, a, a twin engine. This is a uh, AT-9 Curtis Wright. He also flew a, uh, a Cessna Bobcat. And then finally, he graduated from uh, advanced pilot training on April, 20, April 12th of 1943, where he received his pilot's wings and his commission as a second lieutenant. From there, he went through transitional crew training, where he learned how to fly a four-engine Beach 17 bomber. And then from there, he went to operational crew training, where the various members of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. And then once deemed ready, they were assigned overseas to the uh, European Theater of Operations. On October 21st of 1943, my dad and his crew reported to the 306 Bomb Group at Thurlie, England. It was located about 60 miles north of London. 
Uh, this is a picture of what the base looked like back then. It's no longer there, but there's a nice little museum that there is there now. Although the surrounding countryside pretty much remains the same. It's all rural farmland, little country roads uh, running throughout. Uh, it's very quaint. Here you see the emblem of the 306 bomb group. Uh, there were three air divisions in the 8th Air Force. Uh, first, second, and third, uh, 306 was in the first air division, which was signified by a triangle. And then each bomb group was signaled by, uh, des designated by a letter, and the 306 was H. Uh, some of you might recall the movie uh, 12 O'Clock High starring Gregory Peck. Well, that was actually uh, based on a true story about the 306 bomb group. Uh, the 306, uh, the fictitious bomb group in the movie, the 918th, was derived by multiplying multiplying the 306 by 3. <laughs> Another distinction that the 306 uh, has is that their flight surgeon, Dr. Thurman Schuler, was responsible for convincing 8th Bomber Command General Ira Eaker to implement a, a mission limit of 25. Prior to that, there were no mission limits at all, and the, uh, these bomber crews quickly realized that they were never going to make it through the war without a limit, because they'd either be killed or be shot down and become POWs. Uh, he initially uh, lobbied uh, General Eaker to put in a mission limit of uh, 20, but uh, he raised it to 25. And then after Jimmy Doolittle took over the 8th Air Force in January of 1944, he eventually raised it to 30 and then 35. There were four uh, bomb squadrons uh, in each bomb group. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you have the uh, Clay Pigeons so named uh, by a journalist because of the heavy losses they took during the war. Uh, the Clay Pigeons, the 367th, took more losses than any other bomb squadron in the entire 8th Air Force. And then you had the uh, Eager Beavers, uh, the Grim Reapers, and then my dad's squadron, the 369th, fight and bite. I always like to point out the ground crew. These combat crews got all the recognition and the glory, but really these ground crews are the guys that kept these planes flying. After they came back from a mission, they'd spend, uh, they'd stay up all night in horrible weather typically, uh, doing battle damage, doing maintenance on the plane, getting them ready to go back out. Uh, they consider these planes their plane. They just let them out to the combat crews occasionally to fly combat missions. So they were really the unsung heroes. Here you see my dad's crew. My dad was the first pilot uh, and as such, the commander of the plane and the crew, and then you have four uh, officers, the first pilot, the co-pilot, uh, the navigator, and the bombardier, and then six enlisted men and non-commissioned officers who were, who were mainly gunners. This is not the Susan Ruth, it's just a plane that they took their crew picture in front of when they arrived in England. I do like to point out the nose art. Um, I love the nose art. Uh, it's interesting that the Air Force was the only entity that allowed their planes to be painted. The Navy didn't, the Marines didn't, nor did other countries. But the Air Force thought it would help the mor morale of these young guys if they could name and paint their planes to personalize them. And these guys were very creative in what they named and painted their planes. You know, many times it was a cartoon character, but more often than not, it was a scantily clad or nude woman. Nude woman. And after all, these guys were in their late uh, teens and early 20s, so they were very young men. Uh, the 306 bomb group flew uh, B-17s, uh, like the one you saw uh, out front. Uh, it was nicknamed the Flying Fortress because of the armament that they carried on the plane. They had 12 to 15 caliber, uh, 50, uh, 50 caliber machine guns that could put out a tremendous amount of firepower. They could also take a tremendous amount of battle damage and keep flying. Uh, there were actually four, three different types of models of B-17s flown in, in Europe. Uh, to begin with, with the, was the E model, but they only made about a little over 500 of those. So they were quickly phased out by the next model, which was the F model. And then they were uh, phased out uh, by the G model in the fall of 1943. You can always tell the G model by the, uh, the chin turret that's under the nose, like the Starduster out here. Uh, each, each plane had tail markings to identify it. Here again you have the Triangle H of the 306 Bomb Group in the 1st Air Division. And then each uh, plane had a specific tail number that was assigned by the manufacturer. Uh, Boeing designed and manufactured 64% of the B-17s, but Lockheed Vega 
and the Douglas Aircraft Company each uh, produced about 18% as well. Here are the crew positions on the plane. Uh, here, in the, again, this is the G model uh, with the chin turret. And then uh, up in the nose of the plane, you have the bombardier, the navigator, up above them with the two pilots, the flight engineer, top turret gunner, the bomb bay, the radio operator, ball turret gunner, two waist gunners, and then the tail gunner. Uh, in the bomb bay, the bombs were hung in racks on each side of the plane. And it was really cramped in there. This uh, catwalk is about eight inches wide, and this boy is uh, eight years old, so you can see how cramped that was. And it wasn't uncommon uh, during a bomb run that occasionally these bombs would get hung up in those racks, which require one of the crewmen either kick it loose with his foot or take a wrench and knock it loose. And I can't imagine what that must have been like, because so those bomb bay doors are open, he's looking five miles straight down to the ground and the winds howling around him. It took a lot of courage to do that. Here you see the crew positions a little more clearly. Uh, this is the F model without the chin turret. Uh, you have the bombardier up front. His job was to drop the bombs accurately, but in the G model, uh, when they were under attack, he also manned the chin turret. Then you have the navigator. He didn't need to know where they were going and where they were, and uh, when they were under attack, he manned the cheek turrets. If you noticed on the B-17 out there, there were two cheek guns on each side of the plane. Whoops. And then above uh, them, you have the two pilots, the first pilot in the left seat and the co-pilot in the right seat. And you needed two pilots to fly these planes. Obviously, if one was uh, killed or injured, you had another pilot to fly it. But you needed two pilots to fly these planes. Back then, you really had to fly the planes, unlike today. And these missions were eight, uh, to 10 hours long, so it was very strenuous, both men uh, mentally and physically, to fly these planes. They flew in tight formation, so they had to stay alert at all times, or they could run in the plane in, in front of them, or clip a wing on the plane next to them and go down. Also, they had to continually fight the currents, uh, the, the turbulence, air, air currents. You have the normal, normal turbulence of uh, the weather, which a lot of you experienced in commercial flights, but also they had to fight the, the turbulence of all those B-17s uh, being in such close proximity to one another. So the prop wash and the wake turbulence would just churn the air up. And so it was uh, a big job. They switched off the co-pilot, flew the plane as much as the pilot did. Then behind the, uh, the pilots, you have the uh, flight engineer. He also manned the, uh, the top turret when they were under attack. He, he was also referred to as the crew chief. Uh, he was onboard mechanic of the plane, knew how everything operated. And he also helped to monitor all the instruments in the plane. In the cockpit, there were over 150 different gauges, switches, toggles, and dials that they had to monitor. So he would help monitor engine performance and fuel consumption. And then after the bomb bay, you have the radio operator. That was the most comfortable position on the plane. He had a a fairly roomy compartment in the chair to sit at. And then the uh, most cramped position on the plane was the ball turret. Again, these missions were, you know, six to ten hours long, and he's in that fetal position for hours on end. Uh, you can imagine how uncomfortable the, that must have been. <clears throat> and then above the ball turret, you had two waist gunners, which are the most expo exposed positions on the plane, and then another cramped position in the back, tail gunner. My dad's first mission was on November 3rd, 1943. It was a mission to Wilhelmshaven. It was the first time the 8th Air Force put up over 500 bombers on a mission. And flying combat missions was extremely dangerous and just exceedingly brutal. And it was dangerous from the time they took off to the time they landed. Uh, to begin with, uh, in England, at its peak, the 8th Air Force had about 40 bomber bases in an in, uh, area called East Anglia, which is about the size of Vermont. And on the day of a mission, you had hundreds of these bombers taken off from these bases all at the same time. And back then, there was no air traffic control. There was no radar. It was all based on visual sight. And typically, the weather was always socked in, and you couldn't see anything until you got above the cloud layer. So mid-air collisions were not uncommon at all. And then they had to form up. Individual planes formed up into three-plane elements. Elements formed up into bomb squadrons. Bomb squadrons formed up into bomb groups. Bomb groups formed up into combat wings. Combat wings formed up into air divisions. And all this took an hour to two hours before they could even head across the English Channel to 
begin their mission. Then they had to deal with the elements. Now, these planes were not pressurized, so above 10,000 feet they had to go on oxygen, or else they'd soon pass out, in a few minutes they'd be dead. It also was extremely cold, it was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero up there. And so frostbite was a huge problem, and there were many airmen that were hospitalized for uh, lengthy periods of time with, with serious frostbite injuries. Here you see the combat uniform of a, uh, a waste gunner. He has his steel helmet on and tinted goggles because of the brightness of the sky at that altitude. His oxygen mask and then his fleece lined jacket and uh, pants, uh, thermal boots and gloves. And this is a flak jacket. It was an apron that had metal plates in the front and the back to help protect him. And then if you notice this uh, white strap there, that's the parachute harness. They didn't actually wear their parachutes in the plane because it was too cramped. Uh, if they needed to bail out, they had, they had their wits about them to find their parachute to begin with, and then uh, hook it on uh, from the back of the harness, and then jump out of the plane. Once they got across the English Channel, the next thing they had to deal with was uh, enemy fighters. Uh, the German, Germany had uh, radar stations set up along the continental coast of Europe, so they knew when these bombers were coming, and they'd send up their air force to Luftwaffe to intercept them. Uh, here again, you see the uh, uh, waist gunner with his goggles, flak jacket, all these spent cartridges uh, on the ground. Here's his 50 caliber machine gun. And the ammunition came in belts that were 20 fi 27 feet long. So if he fired the whole belt, he said he fired the whole nine yards. And that's where that expression came from. At the beginning of the war, it was 8th Bomber Command's belief that these heavily armed bombers flying in these tight formations could defend themselves from the German Luftwaffe. They flew in uh, what was called a combat box formation, and this is the box of a combat wing. And then within the, the wing, the box of the wing, you have three boxes representing bomb groups. And then within each bomb group, you have three boxes representing bomb squadrons. So that was all this interlacing firepower it could uh, ward off the uh, German fighters. Here you see another uh, view of the formation from on top. It was a three-dimensional formation. You had a lead squadron, then a high, high group, and then a, a low group, and then this is from uh, behind. Unfortunately, 8th Bomber Command's belief that they could defend themselves was, was sadly mistaken. Uh, at the beginning of the war, uh, 1942, especially 1943, the 8th Air Force took devastating losses. Uh, and then when they finally gave them fighter support, the, the fighters didn't have the fuel capacity to escort the bombers all the way deep into Germany. They could make it across the channel into occupied Europe a ways, but then they'd have to turn around when their fuel got, fuel got low and head back to England. Well, that really didn't help the bombers all that much because the Luftwaffe would just wait till the U.S. fighters would head back and then, and then they'd, they'd come in. It, it, it culminated in, in the fall of 1940, excuse me, the 19, 1943, in what was called Black Week. During a four uh, mission period, the 8th Air Force lost 148 planes in four missions. That's almost 1,500 men, with the worst day being uh, August 13th, uh, 1943. It's called Black Thursday, when the 8th Air Force lost 60 planes in one mission. That's 600 men. The, eighth, uh, the 306 bomb group lost 10 out of the 15 planes that they put up there. Swineford, yeah, second Swineford mission at ball bearing factories. Um, even though they implemented that uh, 25 mission limit, it was statistically impossible to complete 25 missions. Uh, the average number of missions flown before being shot down was only six. But after Black Week and uh, Black Thursday, the second Schweinfurt mission, the 8th Air Force was in shock, basically. Uh, there was no way they could continue sustaining those types of losses. Uh, and they seriously considered uh, giving up daylight bombing. And for the rest of 1943, they didn't go into Germany at all, and they only flew about five or six missions the rest of the year. It wasn't until right at the end of 43, the beginning of 44, when the P-47 Thunderbolts were given external fuel tanks and the introduction of the P-51 Mustang, that these bomber formations finally had adequate support that could take them, go with them all the way deep into Germany and back. Uh, the P-51 Mustang was especially effective. Uh, they basically wiped out the German Luftwaffe in the spring of 1944. 
The next thing they had to deal with was anti-aircraft fire. Here you have a, a flak gun. It was a, flak was the abbreviation for aircraft defense cannon in, in, in German, Germany. Germany. And they could fire 20 shells a minute, and they were calibrated to explode uh, at the same altitude that the bombers were flying. They were deadly weapons. And they were, these shells were filled with all these different types and shapes of, shapes of razor short metal that would just burst out hundreds of feet when they uh, were exploded. And they could easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of these bombers. It was so thin you could take a screwdriver and just poke it right through it. From a distance, they looked pretty like harmless black puffs, but as these formations got closer, these puffs got bigger, the explosions got louder, and once in amongst the exploding flak, uh, these uh, concussions of these shells exploded, which just violently rocked the ship. If a bomber was hit uh, directly, it would basically disintegrate and just disappear. If it hit a wing, the bomber would just plummet like a rock. I can't imagine what these guys uh, must have been thinking as they headed into this killing field, not knowing if the next moment might be their last. My dad said even though you know, it was so cold at that altitude, he would just be sweating profusely during these bomb runs and just be dripping wet uh, because of the adrenaline running through his, through his bodies. Uh, once they uh, got near the, the target, they reached a point, uh, a pre-designated point called the IP, or initial point, and that's where they started their bomb run. And at that time, the first pilot gave control of the plane over the bombardier, who flew the plane through the Norden bomb site. Uh, it was tied into the autopilot of the plane. It was a revolutionary device. It was an analog computer that could calculate uh, the altitude of the plane, the speed of the plane, uh, wind speed, crosswind, so that the bombardier could accurately drop the bombs. And it was very secretive. The bombardiers had to uh, swear, take an oath that they would uh, protect that Norton bomb site with their life. After the, uh, well, here you see the uh, bombardier looking through the crosshairs of the Norton bomb site. Once he dropped the bombs, he yelled, bombs away. And that signaled uh, the first pilot to take control over the plane again. And then the first pilot would make a big turn and head to another pre-designated point called a rally point, where these bombers would try to form up and then head back to England. It was on a mission to Frankfurt, Germany on February 8th of 1944 that my dad dropped uh, their bombs successfully. But the bomb bay doors got hit by flak and they couldn't get them back up. And as a result, that caused a drag in the plane. They lost airspeed and they started to lag behind the formation. And unfortunately, uh, their fighter support at the time uh, took off and left the uh, formation unguarded. They went after some German fighters and got engaged in a dogfight. And that left the formation unguarded and two Focke-Wolf German fighters uh, saw my dad's plane lagging behind and came in for the kill. And as a result, the Susan Ruth was shot down. Uh, Two of the men were killed in the plane, the other eight bailed out successfully, but both those German fighters were shot down as well. Uh, one piloted by Siegfried Merrick crashed, he was killed in the plane, and the other was piloted by Hans Berger, who was able to bail out of the plane, and he made it through the war. When I was doing my research one day, my wife asked me, well, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? Which I thought was, you know, a ridiculous idea. Yeah, pretty stupid, but I didn't tell her that. <laughs> um, but like a good husband, I did what she told me to do. <laughs> and lo and behold, I found Hans Berger. And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war, so he speaks English. And he gave me some uh, wonderful information about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force that's in the book. Uh, my dad, being the first pilot, was the last one to bail out of the plane. And he came down in these trees. Uh, this is a picture that was sent to my dad after the war. There's over 200 time period photographs in the book so you can visualize everything that you're reading about. His parachute got hung up with those trees. He was dangling 20 feet off the ground and couldn't get down. But fortunately for him, two young Belgian farmers, Henri Franken and uh, Raymond Dervan, came to his rescue before the, the Germans got to him. Uh, they went back to the farmhouse, got a ladder and a rope to help him get down this tree, that's on Lee Franken, standing next to the tree. And it was about one o'clock in the afternoon when this took place, and they thought it was too dangerous to move him during the daytime with those German patrols combing the area, so they told him to hide and he'd come back to get him at night. 
And that night they came back and they took him to the farmhouse of Raymond Durban's parents. His farmhouse is still there today. And the farmhouse is uh, in Belgium, but those trees are in France, so it's right on the border. He spent one night there. They thought it was too dangerous for him to stay there any longer than that. And then the next night, uh, Belgium customs officer Paul Tilqueen uh, came with a tandem bike to pick up my dad and take him to uh, another location. Uh, they headed out on the, the bike. My dad had shrapnel wounds in one of his legs, so he could only pedal uh, with one leg, and they came to a hill, and they really couldn't pedal it up any hill anymore. So they started pushing it up, uh, and it was raining, pitch black at night, and they got, got to the top of the hill, and there was a little cap, a cabaret uh, cafe at the top, uh, the lights were on, music was playing, people were laughing, and all of a sudden, two Luftwaffe officers with young girl, their arms around young girls come walking out, and one of, them, one of them puts his arm around my dad and asks him for a light for a cigarette. <laughs> My dad can't speak German or Belgian or French at this time, so he's, he's pretty scared. But uh, fortunately, Paul could let the guy cigarettes, and then they let him go on their way. My dad said they were, they were too drunk and too involved in their girlfriend to pay much attention to these two guys you know, pushing a bike up the hill. And after that, uh, my dad was moved around from house to house to house. Uh, he stayed with many Belgian people. Uh, how long he stayed at any given house depended on how brave the people were who lived there and how dangerous the underground thought it was for him to stay there. He might stay uh, one night at one house or six weeks at another house. Uh, these are two of my dad's uh, helpers. They always refer to him as helpers. Uh, that he stayed with for fairly lengthy periods of time, who he became friends with and stayed in touch with after the war. Uh, on the left is just Lane Bayou. It was with her and her husband Maurice that he wrote his diary. And then to his, on the right here is Jeanette Gedin. Her husband was a captain in the French army who had been captured by the Germans in 1940 when they first invaded the lowlands. So he spent the rest of the war as a POW. And these people that hit my dad or any down airman for that matter were unbelievably brave. They risked their lives and those of their family and friends aiding down airmen. Uh, if they were found out by the Gestapo, the German secret police, they would be hauled in, you know, interrogated, uh, tortured, uh, sent to prison, or, or shot. Uh, my dad said they saved their lives. They gave him their bed. They'd sleep on the floor, gave him the majority of the food. Uh, unbelievable pe people. Uh, Jeanette Gedin on the right here, she was taken in and beaten several times. Uh, Paul Till Queen, who I showed you, he was uh, a few months later was arrested, uh, sent to prison, tortured, and he just narrowly escaped being executed. But his health was broken and he died in his early 50s from the, the torture that he, he underwent. Unbelievably brave people. But it was also very stressful for, for my dad. Um, you can imagine, first of all, he's shot out of the sky, his plane's on fire, he has to bail out, comes down in a foreign country, has no idea where he is doesn't know what happened to his buddies on the plane, uh, on the crew, uh, can't communicate with the U.S. military, and he's relying on people that he, complete strangers, he can't speak the language. Uh, any one of them could be a collaborator and turn him uh, over the, to the Gestapo, and when he was in hiding at any time, because the Gestapo could just break in and either arrest him and uh, send him to prisoner of war camp or shoot him. So, so finally, he got tired of hiding. I guess he, he got tired of being the, the hunted and wanted to become the hunter. So he joined the French resistance called the Mackey. Uh, this isn't his group, but it just gives you an idea of, of the Mackey. They were uh, small independent guerrilla fighters that were located all across France. There were about 20 in my dad's group. It was led by a French lieutenant who had escaped from a German prisoner of war camp. There were a few Frenchmen, Belgians, and some Algerians in my dad's unit. And their job was to go basically to harass the Germans. Uh, they would disrupt uh, communications, sabotage railroad lines, attack convoys, assassinate German officers. And they were supplied by the British through airdrops, and then they got their instructions from the British through coded messages over the BBC. My dad said that their information they gave him was unbelievably accurate. He said if uh, they, they were told that there'd be a convoy coming down this road at this time on this day, sure enough, there, there'd be one. 
and there's several instances in the book of my dad's encounters uh, with uh, with the Germans when he was fighting in the resistance. Also, several episodes where he almost got discovered by the Gestapo when he was when he was in hiding. Uh, this was a farmhouse in uh, France where the uh, his resistance group was stayed. Uh, that's still there today too. Now, on one occasion, he was in the upper floors and. Uh, German patrol came up the road and he had, he was, it was early in the morning, just had his skivvies on, was shaving cream in his face, he had to jump out the window and then hide tail in the woods so he wouldn't get, wouldn't get caught. This next picture, I don't know how, who picked, took this picture or how it ever got back to my dad, um, but this is him fighting with the resistance. Some of the other members of the, of the Mackey group there. Finally, uh, seven months after he bailed out his plane, uh, he heard, got word that uh, there were U.S. troops in the nearby village of Trelon, France. So he walked on over into the, the village square, went up to an army major. It happened to be Patton's Third Army who had come up through France after D-Day and identified himself. And after he was interrogated, they sent him to Paris and he got back to England and uh, came back to the United States. Uh, Belgium's a very unique country. A lot of people don't realize that it's really uh, divided in two. Uh, the upper half of Belgium is called Flanders, where they speak Dutch, and it's rather industrial. And the lower half of uh, Belgium is called Wallonia, where they speak French, and it's very rural. It's all farmland. My dad and his crew came down right around here. Actually, my dad on the plane came down in Belgium, and the other guys that were able to bail out came down in France. Uh, he was hidden in Charleroi for a while, both uh, Jeanette Gadin and uh, uh, the other woman I just mentioned uh, lived in Charleroi, and then uh, that farmhouse where the Mackey group stayed, and then Trello in France is, is right around here. I've been to Belgium four times. It's, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful country. Uh, to this day, they're so thankful and so grateful still for the Americans rescuing them from Nazi oppression. And they do a great job of educating the younger generations about it as well. They've erected a number of memorials in the area on and, and every anniversary, annual anniversary, they have a ceremony at those memorials. But the big ceremonies is always around September 2nd, which is the liberation date of Belgium. And those celebrations last for several days. Uh, this is a, a poster from 2014, the 70th anniversary. Uh, and they erect these big tents. This is just a part of a tent. They sit, seat hundreds of people. They have band concerts, lunches, dinners, uh, dances. They're great affairs. Uh, all the people that uh, volunteer dress in uh, period costumes and the local beer chimney just flows. And everyone has a great time. Uh, they have ceremonies at various memorials in the area. This is the memorial at Sendron, which is right at the French-Belgian border where the U.S. 9th Infantry first crossed over from France into Belgium on September 2nd to liberate the country. And all the local villagers come out, uh, the U.S. military, Belgian military, uh, French military, all the local dignitaries uh, make speeches. And again, you can see they, they put the, these children right up front so they get a, a better appreciation of what's going on. This is a memorial that was erected to my dad and his crew. Uh, like most World War II vets, my dad didn't talk a lot about the war until this memorial was erected in 1989. And he and the three other living members of the crew went over for the dedication. And there he was reunited with a lot of the Belgian people that hit him during the war and saw those houses where he was hidden. And that brought it all back. And he started talking about it quite a bit after that. Uh, I went uh, with my parents in 1994. That was my first trip to Belgium. And that's when it became personal for me because I saw things firsthand and was actually able to meet a couple of his Belgian uh, helpers. Uh, Paul Tilquin's Til Til uh, wife, Nellie, uh, was still alive at the time. I've been to Belgium four times. The last trip was 2016. Uh, I went over to Belgium and filmed all the locations that are talked about in the book. I'm in the, uh, in the works of making a documentary. And then uh, after Belgium, I went to Munich, Germany, where I filmed an interview with Hans Berger. This is what Hans Berger looks like today. He's 94 years old. And we've become very good friends in, uh, over the last few years. He's getting up there, though.
This is uh, my dad and uh, me in 2004 uh, at the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. He wanted to visit there before he died. So I accompanied him on a reunion of the Air Force Escape and Evasion Society. Uh, this was right before the official dedication of the memorial in uh, May of uh, 2004. And it was the last trip he ever took. Uh, he wasn't the last crew member to die, but he was illness at 91. And virtually all the World War II veterans are in their 90s today. At the end of World War II, there were 16 million veterans. And less than 4% of those men are still with us today. There was no other event in history that affected more people than World War II. 60 million people died, millions more were wounded, millions more were left homeless and displaced. It changed the course of America and the world forever. And the brave young men who fought and died for freedom are definitely members of the greatest generation. Their sacrifice must never be forgotten. It is our duty to remember. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, was your father acknowledged by the French or Belgian government for his partisan efforts at all with the Maki or anything like that? Did he get considered No, that really didn't just start until uh, after my dad had passed. Now the Legion of Honor, you know, is uh, if you're still alive, you get the French Legion of Honor. And they're doing a much better job of that, of recognizing uh, those guys. But no, he didn't. Yes, sir. You mentioned the parachutes would have to be attached on the run, so to speak. They needed the money to attach the parachutes. Well, they, they, they could click it on uh, hooks on the back of the harness themselves. They didn't have to have uh, their buddy do it. Although sometimes, and in my, in my dad's case, you know, a buddy had to do it. Did he go out through the bomb bay doors? No, my dad went out through the forward hatch. Yeah, the, they were, the plane was on fire, so he had no idea what was happening in the behind the bomb bay. He only knew, you know, the, the, the bombardier navigator in front of him, his co-pilot, and then the flight engineer was right behind him. Um, he knew that they bailed out, but he didn't know what was going on in the back of the plane. He had no idea until he got back to England what happened to any of them. Oh yeah. Five of them made it back, I should have meant, didn't mention Five of them made it back, but five of them did not. Both of them were shot down. Well, my dad's plane actually shot down Hans Berger. You know, that's kind of our joke. He shot my dad down and his gunner shot him down. <laughs> and it, it was undetermined who shot the other plane down. You showed the echelon formation. Do you know how they avoided or minimized the danger of sweeping each other with gunfire? That's a, that, that's a good question. It comes up quite a bit. Some of the guns had, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the term, the term, but uh, guides kind of, that they couldn't go too far or too, or too high. So that helped. Um, but it was still an issue. I've never really read anything about planes being shot down by other B-17s, but I'm nobody admitted. <laughs> yeah, I got I got the German. I didn't get up. <laughs> you know, it was it was really hard to tell you know who shot down these planes because the closing speed was like 600 miles an hour. So these gunners just had a couple seconds to fire their weapon, and so it was real difficult. You know, there were many more German planes that were claimed shot down that were actually shot down. Because you had gunners from, and these formations from various planes, plus the U.S. fighters all firing at these German fighters all at the same time. So it was kind of difficult to tell who shot down a plane. Did your dad, <clears throat> you talked about how cold it was up there in the 40s and 60s. Low. And that's inside the plane. 
when he jumped out, did he ever talk about how cold that was as he was bailing out? I mean, being outside the plane, much worse than being inside the plane, temperature-wise, I would imagine. Well, that, that's, that's a good question. Actually, in his diary, he talks about, which is in the book, bailing out of the plane and what he felt like after he bailed out and on the way down. Um, but he didn't talk about the cold. He just said, you know, they said yeah, you should count it. But, uh, I forget. He said count to ten, and then, but he still couldn't see the ground after ten. So he just kept waiting, and then he he went through, broke through the clouds, and then he could finally make out objects on the ground. So he decided to pull the chute, and then he said it was just so calm and so quiet. What was happening in that plane just seemed like well, he long ago. He just saw the. He was coming down in those trees and was looking at those trees, but he was he was too weak to uh, pull the shrouds of the parachute that they, to uh, guide himself. Right. He couldn't even lift his. He was arms were just so weak, so he just came down in the trees. Yes, uh, the plane was shot down on February 8th, and on February 23rd, she got a telegram from the War Department saying, uh, your husband is missing in action. And my, my second sister was born when my dad was missing in action. So here my mother's at home, she's got a one-year-old baby girl, an infant girl, not knowing if her husband's ever going to come home again. And she didn't hear from him until he got back to England, and then he sent her a telegram saying that, and that copy of that telegram is in the book saying that uh, I'm okay, baby. <laughs> Bank the money. <laughs> no, they had, uh, the U.S. military didn't know my dad was alive until he uh, went into Trelone and introduced himself. No. Uh -uh. There's no way to communicate. How many missions uh, he was shot down on his eighth mission. Actually, some of his crew members had more missions than he did. He was the center on the basketball team and he tore his ankles, or tore ligaments in his ankles. And so he couldn't fly for two months. So some of his other uh, crew members had uh, more missions. Uh, one thing I'll mention too, a lot of people think that these crews flew the same plane, like on every mission, and it was the same crew on every mission. Yeah, that was not the case, especially early in the war. Maybe at the end of the war, that, that might have been true. Uh, but my dad flew like five different B-17s, and he only flew two missions with his full crew. Somebody was always injured or sick. People were always had the flu or pneumonia in that damp English weather. So that's kind of uh, something most people don't realize. Another thing that's interesting that uh, after my dad came back to England, he was sent back to the U.S. because the, the Air Force had a rule that you couldn't fly combat again if you were shot down over occupied territory and aided by uh, the underground. Because they thought if you were shot down a second time, captured by the Germans and tortured, then you give up the identity of the people that helped you the first time. The only exception to that was Chuck Yeager, who met personally with uh, General Eisenhower and talked him into letting him go back into combat. Uh, the memorial is about 200 yards from the crash site, but the, the, there's nothing left of the, uh, the plane. Uh, the Germans, they needed all the metal and scrap they could get, so if any downed bomber, they would uh, salvage it and uh, uh, send it back to Germany. Uh, the, the, one, uh, the German plane, uh, Siegfried Merrick's plane, that crashed, it came down with such force that it buried itself in the ground, like, uh, I think it was about 20 feet. And in the early 80s, the Belgians dug that plane up. And there's a little museum in Belgium that uh, my dad's donated stuff. And there's quite a few parts of that uh, German fighter plane in this little museum. And then Hans Berger's plane, uh, they salvaged that, although the engine is still buried in the ground. There's only a couple guys who know where that is.
you're, you're exactly right about the Belgian people. I was, I was there three years ago and did a World War II history tour, and they are as appreciative as ever. I mean, fascinating numbers of uh, museums there, and really uh, very warm and welcoming people. So if you ever get the chance to go, go there yourselves, uh, I would strongly encourage you to do so. If anyone gets the southern Belgium, I can set you up with a couple of local people to take you around to all the, <laughs> the sites around there. But it is incredible. When I went over with my dad in 94, they treated him like he was the President of the United States. Uh, I'll never forget the time we were a little late to one function. We walked into one of those tents and everyone stood and applauded. I get chills just talking about it. And then when I went back the second time in 2004, they treated me like I was one of the U.S. airmen that fought during the war, but as my dad, it was embarrassing. But they, they are wonderful people. I've made some lifelong friends, and I can't wait to go over next year for the 75th anniversary. On the 70th anniversary, I, had about, I convinced about 20 relatives of, our, of my dad's crew to go, and I think we might have up to 40 this time, so that'll be a special trip. Did I miss the part where... Uh about the couple of the crewmen that were executed? I didn't mention that because you got to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, you're giving it away. Robert and his wife, Linda, they're members of the 3L6 bomb crew, friends of mine. Plant. It's a team. Yeah, because three, two died in the plane and then three were killed later on, a couple months later, on the ground. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> I can't even think of them off the top of my head. I should bring. I usually have a list. Um, I, I just a, a, a number of. Well, we could end on that note and then I, I should give that. time yes. to... That's the first time ever anyone's ever asked me. <laughs> yeah. I've never... I just got to forget about it. Yeah. Steve, we could have some time for you to... Uh, yeah, if anyone wants to buy books. a book, they're $25 cash or credit card. Okay. Well, let's give Thank them a hand again. Thank you very much. Thank you.